This is about the fourth mouse I've caught recently. <laughs> I think mice and rats are beautiful. But I'm off to set it free somewhere more appropriate than my cupboard. I think they're beautiful. I used to have a pet rat. But even I acknowledge that it's not very nice <laughs> having them crawling all over your food, in your pantry. Not that this one was, this one was in the bathroom. I would never want to kill it. I mean, from the mice's point of view, it's somewhere dark and warm and safe with a plentiful supply of food. <laughs> I wouldn't it want to come in. Okay, little mouse. What I need to do... Oops, sorry. Yes. They normally bound off. Okay, little mouse. It's always a bit frightened. Good luck. Bon chance. As you will have seen, I've spent part of this morning doing some chainsawing and I brought the chainsaw back up to my workshop. I give it a clean and sharpen the chain after every use and the same with the Husqvarna. So I thought I'd quickly show you the equipment that I use in case you're interested and it's helpful. This is the chainsaw after use and I just take some kitchen towel, kitchen paper and I just like to give the chainsaw a bit of a rub after every time I've used this to help try and keep it in good mix. And I've noticed that uh, th this is where the chain goes round inside and it can get a bit clogged up in there. But, um, that's looking all right. Bit of grass. That's where the battery goes. Then what I like to do is give the chain a sharpen. This is what I use. Will found this bought it online. I'm not sure if you bought it from the company or from a company that stocked it, but it seems to be made by a company called Timberline. It comes in this pouch and weirdly like many American things, it's got this little thing so you can strap it under your belt. I'm sure that's very handy. Anyway, inside here is the attachment which goes onto the chain and in the pouch at the front is this little carbide sharpening uh, tool. <laughs> I'm probably not going to give you a tutorial, it comes with really good instructions and there's loads of tutorials on the internet. But essentially, I'll, I'll set it up and I'll show you, but essentially it helps to take the guesswork out of um, getting the angles right. So it's very, very handy in that respect. Uh, one downside with this chain, 
unlike the Husqvarna. On the Husqvarna, the chain we have anyway, one of the links is a different coloured metal, it's gold. <laughs> this chain, not manufactured by Ryobi, but this chain doesn't have that, so I, what I need to do is I take this uh, wax pastel and mark up one of them because if I don't know where I've started, right, I do them sequentially, so one after the other. If I didn't know where the first one was, I'd just be going round and round and round forever. <laughs> so I've marked it up, and now I'll, I'll set up the um, I'll set up the sharpener, and then I'll show you what that looks like when I've done it. I'm all set up now. So this is the device attached to my chain. And it's got these two holes because um, one of the teeth goes this way and this tooth goes that way. So this does one, this hole does this angle and this hole does that angle. So basically it's worked the angles out for you. Then what you do is um, take the carbide, put it into the hole, you spin it clockwise it goes through and it sharpens. You spin and spin and spin. It sharpens the teeth and you spin it out. Then you pull the chain and move on to the next one. So I'm going to do that now. I can't really film whilst I'm doing that, but if you're interested, we can recommend this piece of equipment for sharpening your chainsaw chain. Can you see that? I'm filming through a window because if I go out there they'll probably just fly away. But that's a pair of crimson rosellas on the fennel. Back in the UK I used to chop the seed heads off and dry them, generate my own fennel seeds, but uh, if you don't Iron-clad plants over here, you can be absolutely guaranteed some sort of other animal <laughs> is going to get there first. So as you can see, this fennel is huge. But I've never, ever, ever got a fennel seed off of it. <laughs> What are you up to? Right. See how they all sort of move as a pack? They go foraging as a pack, they were grooming as a pack. One decided they wanted water so they've all Headed over to the water. Chuffs are fascinating. I wasn't joking about the slug invasion. <laughs> this is not the first slug I've caught in a mouse trap. Absolutely revolting. Don't mind mice. Less than slugs, actually. I'm going to have to try and get that out with a stick. <laughs> I'm off up the drive this morning to recommence a project I call Operation Ditch. Essentially, a while ago um, we bought in a ton of gravel, like literally a ton, <laughs> and I used it to resurface parts of the drive which had particularly bad potholes and had been particularly badly eroded. And I literally lugged it by hand. <laughs> trailer load after trailer load on the back of my lawnmower and then one day it rained and rained and rained and rained and um, for some reason it's hard to show the gradient here but this is uh, a bit of a slope coming down the drive 
and I was out on my morning walk and noticed the rainwater just pouring down the drive and washing a large quantity of my gravel away. And so I now need to resurface the drive again. I think this time I might get two tons. But before I buy it in, what I've been doing is digging a ditch. So it's a, it's a bit hard to see, but uh, this is the ditch that I've dug or re-dug. There was a ditch here, but it's become infilled. And it goes down the hill and drains the water away. And then there's a culvert under the drive about here which takes the overflow from our pond, which is here, and the ditch water under the drive and towards the creek, which for those of you who are interested in the geography, is down there. So this section is complete, but when it rains, I notice there's a section further up where, again, the ditch has been so infilled, the water just sits on top of the drive and floods it. Um, so I need to uh, prevent that from happening before I can put the gravel down. I started digging it quite a long time ago, but conditions have been so unfavourable. This is the first day I've been able to recommence work on that project because either it's, it's rained so much, the ditch is completely filled with water, and um, which means that the soil will be so heavy, it will be very hard for me to dig, or the water's drained away, but it's been so stinking hot it would be unbelievably unpleasant to dig in that weather, so I just haven't bothered. But today, I'm off to restart my project. I'm further along our drive now, and this is where I've left off. A neighbour of ours did kindly offer to come and help with his machinery, his tractor, and some sort of like gougy tool. Um, but I decided to not take him up on that offer and he was fine with that. He, he conceded that this looks nicer. That would have looked pretty awful. And aesthetics are important to me as much as functionality. Um, but I quite like also doing things slowly by hand. Well, not necessarily slowly, but by hand. I feel like I'm getting to know the property way more intimately by taking my time and doing things more slowly. Fortunately, uh, I trained as an archaeologist, so I have excellent digging skills. <laughs> it is one of my top skills, along with some other skills that I uh, won't mention here. <laughs> and um, I don't actually have very far to dig, so I'm just carrying along. You, you can probably see the sort of remnants of the original ditch. It's just been left to fill in, so it's no longer functioning. But I probably will take take it down to about that tea tree and see how that goes and then I'll be able to fill in some of these potholes. It doesn't look so bad up here but there are some really big holes up there and uh, the, but the worst of it's back behind me. something pretty cool. I don't know if you can see, but I think these are the burrows of an animal known as a land yabby. Uh, some sort of crustacean, I don't know if it's like a prawn. Anyway, imagine a prawn or like a tiny lobster. <laughs> but this is one that lives not in the sea, but uh, inland, hence land yabby. I feel a bit bad about digging this up. There's no evidence that there's land yabbies running around all frightened, so this may be abandoned. Um, but I, I, I hope it is anyway. I don't, I don't want to destroy this creature's home. But uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid I have to carry on. Once I start a project, I am pretty single-minded. And almost nothing will stop me. Sorry, land yabby. There we 
are. So that's the line where the existing piece, the ditch, had been dug. And this is the line what I've dug today, well this morning. Down towards the tea tree where I stopped, which was my target for today. But just to show you, this is a mound that a land yabby makes. So it's about the span of my thumb to the top of my finger tool. It's like a sort of clay chimney. That's the key indicator that you've got them. But then there's all these little holes underground that I didn't know were there till I started digging. So luckily we're in for a bit of rain, not for the next few days, but uh, maybe next week. So if it rains enough, that means I can come out and have a look, see how the drive's looking, and then plan my next section of ditch digging if I need to. And if not, it means that at some point in the near future I'll be able to order it up that gravel and uh, resurface the drive again. <laughs> Welcome to autumn. New season, new quarter, which can only mean one thing, performing one of our quarterly tasks. I will be cleaning the windows. Cobwebs. <laughs> But uh, I won't film it this time, but what I will film is the chimney sweeping. So I've set up the brush, set up the ladder, ready for Will to go up there and sweep the chimney and I'll stay down and deal with the remnants, or well, deal with what comes out. Back in Scotland our chimney was swept once a year by a professional chimney sweep, but we found that in order to have the range working at optimal um, efficiency, we have to sweep it every quarter and we do it ourselves because I don't even know if chimney sweeps are a thing over here. <laughs> we certainly struggle to find one. We're all set up, ready to go. I'm back inside now, this is the range and this is the flue and this hatch comes off here to reveal the innards, oh, sorry, to reveal the innards so the brush will be coming down this direction and pushing all the ash and soot into the base of the range where I'll scrape it out. We tend to get a lot, um, even though we do it every quarter. I think it's just a function of the types of wood that we burn. Back in Scotland we were burning kiln dried nice woods, but we don't have that luxury here, it would cost us a fortune. Not that we burn green wood, we do burn wood that's pretty well dried, but I guess it's just different. So there are very few days of the year where the range is not hot and obviously we sweep the chimney before we light the range. Chimney sweeping day is also range renovation day. So I take this opportunity to give it a really good clean and an oil. And it's looking lovely, which it will do for about three days. <laughs> then it'll get covered in dust again and look awful for the next 12 weeks until we sweep the chimney again. And finally, just to put it into a bit of context, some of what's in this bucket is ash from the um, firebox, which I clean out when I'm cleaning the range. But a lot of that is soot which came out of the chimney, so that's a normal size bucket. So as you can see, it's definitely worth doing. <laughs> 